Hi, I'm Otelia Cassidy. Welcome to Small Farm, Small Kitchen, brought to you by Madison Magazine. In this series, we'll visit farms around Wisconsin, meet the farmers, and learn about their products. Then we'll head to our very small kitchen, where we'll make a dish using these local farm fresh ingredients. I'm with John and Dorothy Prisky at Fountain Prairie Farm and a cow in Fall River, Wisconsin. And John and Dorothy raise Scottish Highland cattle, which is a heritage breed of cattle. They have been raising these grass-fed and grain-finished cattle for about 12 years. And they're also at the forefront of the farm conservation movement. So today we're going to learn a little bit more about what John and Dorothy do here, as well as what their cows do. <laughs> They have a tougher tongue and throat, so they're able to uh, help clear land like in shrubbier areas. And we thought, well, they might work well along the creek. And another thing that appealed to us is that um, they don't need housing. Even this last winter, which was pretty brutal, they were very comfortable. They have a double layer of hair. So they have the nice downy layer and then the long shaggy hair uh, above that. We've uh, really worked on the genetics over the years and uh, even though it's a heritage breed or a minor breed uh, that means they haven't been messed with genetically mm -hmm. like say the dairy cows that are uh, couldn't withstand a cold Wisconsin winter if they had to. There's over 90 breeders of Highland cattle in the state of Wisconsin but uh, it turns out that they're kind of messed up in a lot of inbreeding. So it's taken us years and years to call and call and keep the best of the best and breed the best of the best. And it's pretty obvious from looking at each of these cows that walk by today how beautiful they look. And in any cowman's uh, eye, these would look like good cows. We started out with a herd of uh, 12. This. Quite a bit smaller yeah, than quite what a bit you have smaller. Now. Right now we have about 175 animals on the farm, which is down from our peak of 550. And so what is it about the meat that makes them so special? They're slow growing and we don't push them. Um, so they're physiologically mature and then we dry age them for 21 days on the rail and the combination just uh, is working out really well for us. This is opposed to uh, meat you may get in the supermarket where uh, the animal is slaughtered, it's hung to cool, it's cut into primal pieces, uh, cryovac in a big plastic bag and then shipped wherever it's going so it ages in that same bag and the, the moisture doesn't evaporate, it stays wet inside the bag. So we lose about 10% of the animal's weight during the uh, dry aging process. But the result is much better. <laughs> it is, it is, and if you've cooked any of the, uh, the cuts, you probably notice that you don't lose a lot in shrinkage. We use a, a rotational grazing. We move them fast from paddock to paddock, so we give the grass rest. So they'll be in here a day, and then tomorrow they'll be in another one. And they'll be covering the farm pretty fast. We much prefer more permaculture, mm -hmm. more permanent grass cover to keep the land where it belongs. But here it gives you a good idea of why we would restore a wetland that was cornfields when really all it is is a prairie pothole. And then all the water that you see from all around us ends up there. It's mm -hmm. all got to get down there somehow. In farming today they try to speed the water up and our goal is to slow the water down as much as possible, retain as much water on this land as we possibly can. And the wetlands really uh, purify the water before it leaves. Uh, and that's the whole purpose. And it also provides uh, a nesting cover for uh, waterfowl, like mallard hens, cranes, as well as uh, songbirds and everything that's migrating through in the spring and, and again in the fall. It's not just being a farmer and not just producing something, that, but we all have to do that. We have to be economically viable, we have to be uh, socially just, and we have to take care of the environment. And why wouldn't you if that's where you live? Mm -hmm. 
but it's it boils down to really building relationships be, building relationships with your land the wildlife the animals your customers um, with each other and and that that really I think is the uh, kind of the secret of life is just building these really good relationships connecting uh, people to the land we call it the good farmers approach to land stewardship and food production uh, which I like that line and uh, I think it's very important that land stewardship should come first and production later but food not only for people but for animals as well Thank you so much to John and Dorothy for having us out here at Fountain Prairie Farm. Now we're going to head to our small kitchen where we'll try a new recipe featuring their tri-tip. Let's get started making our grilled tri-tip. We're going to be grilling this delicious tri-tip from Fountain Prairie Farms and then we'll make some steak sandwiches. First things first though, we're going to start by caramelizing some shallots and then we'll make the rub. So I put just a little bit of oil in here. I'm using Driftless Organic Sunflower Oil, which is great because it's a local oil. Heating it very gently in the bottom of this skillet. To caramelize shallots or onions, the idea is that you want to saute them on very low heat for a long time until they soften and brown and all the sugars are released. We'll let these shallots cook in here for a little while, probably about 20 minutes or so. We'll check on them once in a while to stir them, but meanwhile, let's make our rub. I marinated the steak overnight in a quarter cup each of olive oil and diced shallots. You'll want to make sure that the steak is at room temperature so that it grills evenly. So take it out of the fridge about two to three hours before you're going to cook it. To make the rub, I'm going to combine three cloves of fresh garlic, about a tablespoon each of brown sugar and salt, a teaspoon of fresh thyme, a little bit of hatch hot chili powder and about two teaspoons or so of Wahio chili powder. I chose these two chili powders because I like the flavor of chili uh, and the earthiness that it gives to a rub, but sometimes I don't want all the heat or my children don't want all the heat. So in this case, Wahio chili powder gives a lot of flavor without a lot of heat. If you like a hotter rub, go ahead and add more cayenne or a different hot chili powder to your mix. So I'm just going to crush the garlic into this bowl. Put the remaining ingredients in here. And then I'll just mix it up. When you're done, you should have a nice paste and probably some fairly messy hands. Tri-tip comes from the bottom of the sirloin on a cow and uh, it's not generally a common cut of meat that you'll find at the grocery store, but you can always ask your butcher or your farmer. And sometimes they come trimmed or untrimmed. If they're untrimmed, you'll find a thick layer of fat on one side, and you'll want to cut most of that fat off. Of course, you want to leave some fat on there so that you get a nice, juicy uh, roast when you're done. Now we'll coat each side of the tri-tip with our rub. We're ready to grill our steak. I have the grill at about 400 degrees and we'll start by grilling it on one side for about 10 to 15 minutes. When you put the steak on the grill, make sure that the trimmed side or the side with the fat goes on top first so that the fat will go into the meat and make it more moist. I'm gonna make a honey mustard sauce which is basically a combination of mayonnaise, mustard, some honey, and a little bit of lemon. I think the honey mustard sauce will complement the steak perfectly on our sandwiches. I'm gonna put about a quarter cup of mayonnaise in the bowl, a heaping tablespoon of mustard, a generous squeeze of honey, about a teaspoon or two, and a smaller squeeze of lemon juice. Delicious, simple, slightly sweet, a little tart and creamy. It's great. It's been about 15 minutes. I think our steak is ready to flip. Mm -hmm. 
We'll let the second side cook about five to ten minutes and then we'll check to see if it's done. It smells delicious. I'm hungry. Now my stomach started growling. I think our steak is done, but to test it for sure, press gently down on the top of the steak and if it feels about like the muscle under your thumb, then it's done. It'll be a little bit pink inside, which will ensure that it's nice and moist. We'll cover our steak with foil for about 10 minutes and then we'll slice it and it'll be ready to serve. It looks like it cooked perfectly. Look how nice and pink it is inside. Delicious juices. Be sure when you slice it, you slice it against the grain. Put a little bit of the honey mustard on each slice of bread. Here I have a sourdough bread from Madison Sourdough. It's got a really nice grain and great flavor. Put a couple of slices of the juicy steak We'll top it with a few of our golden caramelized shallots. I have some Hook's five-year cheddar. I also have some Gouda. I like both of those cheeses, so I'm gonna do half and half. We'll put some greens on here. I also like this with bitter greens or microgreens. I just don't happen to have any today, so we'll use baby spring greens. Our sandwich is ready to eat. Thanks for joining us. You can find more videos at madisonmagazine.com.